When you're animating a shot, you're probably aware that you're going to need certain key poses, golden poses, there's different words for them, but you've probably heard before that you need to have certain important clear poses to show off what is happening in your shot. And it can be tricky to just try to find those in the middle of your workflow. That's why the planning process is so important when you are going to animate something. Whatever your process is, you're trying to figure out upfront what the poses are so that you can just kind of block those into the computer, add the breakdowns, anticipations, overlaps, and so on in whatever workflow you may be using to get your shot done efficiently. And video reference is one of the best tools to do that. I also have a video on video reference, especially for body mechanics and some acting stuff. So if you haven't watched this video, highly recommend it. It will help a ton. But I want to tackle the next thing that once you have some video reference, whether it's something that you have done yourself, a friend has acted it out, or you downloaded it from the internet, whatever the case may be, once you have a video that you're going to be using as part of your planning, how do you analyze it? How do you pull out the key poses and the stuff that's actually useful? And what do you leave behind? So in this video, I'm going to go through several clips that I have on my computer for us to go through together. I'm going to do some drawovers. I'm going to show you the poses that I would use if I were blocking this out. And in some cases, they're poses that I have used because I have animated some of these shots. And some of those animations were done live. So if you want to watch me animate live, ask questions, hang out, link down below to my Twitch and also to my Patreon where I do animation tutoring. If you are struggling with this kind of stuff, I'd love to help how I can. So you can support the channel, check the links. And with that, let's dive in. Animation drawover tool I recommend is SyncSketch.com. It's a free tool that you can upload clips to, your animation to, and you can share it for review and critique, feedback, things like that. Love it. Uh, that's what I'm using now. So just in case I get that question a lot, figured I'd answer it. So we're going to look at this standing jump clip. Uh, if we watch through it, it's just a guy standing in place and he jumps. It's a great parkour jump. And for those who don't know, I have been doing parkour for like 10 years. I don't do it all that often anymore. And it does lend itself a lot to my understanding of body mechanics. So it is very helpful that I, that I do it. By the way, I'd love to do a video breaking down the mechanics of why parkour works the way it does and how to animate it from the understanding of having done it. So if you want that video, let me know. But for this, if I were to break this down, if I were gonna animate this shot, which I have animated this shot before based on this exact video, let me show you how I look for key poses. The first thing I do is I figure out, okay, what's the starting pose? Because it's usually not a T pose or a character standing straight up. That's boring and it's usually not accurate. Here we have a character who's leaned forward and their hips are turned and even the knees, the legs are slightly bent. They aren't just bent this way, they're also kind of bent inwards. So understanding that the, the first pose it's important we got to start from somewhere that's not default and he's even looking slightly down at, at kind of where his target is. So think about the character part of this too. Now there's two things to look for from now on. There are the clear golden key poses, but you also want to be looking at the key poses for specific body parts, especially with things like body mechanics or with acting, the eyes. What I mean by that is this, the next major pose is about here. Frame 47 right here would be the next place that I really consider like the next key pose. And you know, the head facing slightly up, the whole back bent this way, you've got an inverted C curve, knees bent, this whole thing, hips here, arms way back, you get the gist, right? Now that's a great pose. And I'm gonna keep going with these key poses, but the thing that I'm looking for as I'm looking for my stuff is I'm not just looking for pose, 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 and that's all I leave in there. That's how you run into the situation where you do your blocking and then you hit spline and everything gets really floaty and weird and feels very pose to pose. A good way to combat that is number one, you need more keys, but what keys do you need? And I'm gonna get more into this as we go. But one thing I'm looking for is when do certain parts of the body hit their extremes? When do they start or stop moving? So in this case, 47 is the key that I chose to represent the main key pose. But if you look at the arms, the arms have already started moving before this happens. It's not, it's right around, it's probably about 39 or 40. Yeah, let's call it 41. On frame 41 in this case, the arms are at their apex and they have not started descending back around yet. So between 41 and 47, the arms are moving before I ever hit my key pose. That's important because that means I need to set a key on at least the arms, if not the entire body, depends on your workflow again, but I would set a key on 41. It makes this frame an important moment in the blocking because I don't want those arms drifting or moving early or things like that. So while the overall pose is on 47, it's also important to note 41, right? So I'm kind of building in my anticipations, breakdowns, follow throughs, overlapping actions, that kind of stuff. I'm keeping that all in mind to make sure that I can capture the organic movement of my shot, of the reference that I've filmed. And this is important for every shot we're gonna do. But going forward, I'm gonna keep going. And right here, this is what I would consider a breakdown. This could be a key pose, could be a breakdown, however you wanna call it. This is a big change from the last one. So arms down, slightly bent, 
Um, look at that curve of the back. Consider he's wearing a shirt, so his body's, you know, probably also bent in, even though the shirt's kind of poofing out. Think about the, the not the geometry, but like the, the anatomy underneath. Uh, toes, he's got the feet up, so don't keep those feet planted at this point. You gotta make sure the toes come up. Um, and in animation, we're probably gonna want to separate things a little bit, because right now the silhouette's a little muddy, but consider that you may want to shift the legs. Don't copy exactly, push it as you go. See that neck is really straining out. You can even see like the little vein in his neck. So really consider what's happening force-wise. There's a separation as the arms come down, everything's kind of pulling away from the head. And then this is the frame that I would go for my next like main key pose. The last moment, the last frame before those feet come off the ground. So the toes, still mounted, the feet way high up, and we have almost a perfectly straight character. We're not trying to hyperextend the knees, you don't want to pull things too far that things pop, so there's a slight bend in there. Back arched up a tiny bit, chest comes like that, head, shoulders are really high, so when you're posing your character, don't just move the arms, gotta involve the shoulders, the arms, and I could talk about the mechanics of like why all this is happening, but I'm just gonna stick with the reference stuff for now. So, that's my next big key pose. And looking between these two things, uh, sometimes it's important, that's a really big change. If you're looking for a breakdown, we just go in between and say, all right, this looks like kind of the halfway point with like the arms being at the bottom and then at the top. This is technically the halfway point where the, these arms are pointing, you know, from the shoulder point of view, uh, upper arm is pointing perpendicular to the direction it's gonna be going in a minute. But you'll notice that this halfway point from the arm's point of view is on frame 70. If you look right here, that's our first key, and right here is our second key. We are not straight in the middle, we are slightly before that. So timing-wise, we're gonna wanna break this up. If we leave it alone to the computer, it's just gonna evenly go from one to the other, and we don't want that. We want it going up faster and then slowing it down. It's kind of what this is showing, whoosh and then the rest of the body has to catch up because the arms actually hit their kind of apex around 81 instead of 85. Do you see what I'm doing here? I'm trying to break down not just where are my key poses, but where are the key poses for important parts of my character. Now from 85, that's the moment he's about to leave the ground. To me, knowing about physics is really important from the perspective of when you jump, and it's, this is a great thing for any body mechanics exercise, no matter what this is, whether this is like a small foot scuffle, whether this is like a leap, whatever it is, you cannot change your momentum or direction when you are airborne. You just can't do it. It's not a cartoon where you jump and then you can do the swimmy thing to like float through the air and you can't like backpedal to slow yourself down. Once you leave the ground, your velocity going in one direction doesn't change. It's just that your up and down goes up and down. That's the only thing that changes is your, your vertical your forward is only affected by wind resistance and anything that happens to you while airborne, the rest is, is linear, is constant. So for me, the moment a character has like, okay, that's the last frame of them being on the ground. Everything else, I'm just gonna skip straight ahead and I'll come back for posing reasons, but I need to find the frame right here, 148. This is the moment, or maybe I'll go 147, I don't know. Let's just go 146, just, we're gonna push, you would wanna push things, change the timing for your animation, but this pose-wise is my new contact frame for when the character reconnects with the ground. So that gives me 85 to 146. It looks like the camera moves a little bit, which is a little bit tricky. We don't want the camera moving for our animation, but posing, whoosh, that is the start and finish of the jump. I do that first. Somewhere right in the middle, is the top, the apex of that jump. And that's an important moment to say, okay, what, what's happening right in the middle there? And it's kind of this tucked in passing position. Almost looks like a passing position. Arms out front, extended, outstretched, slight bend in the elbows, shoulders up still. That pose is important. And I'll just scrub through in the middle and what I would look for otherwise is just, you know, what's the timing of the legs? Looks like the legs get tucked in about here and then tuck in more, but I feel like that's important to know kind of the ratio time-wise of when the legs come in. And then also the arms. Looks like the arms stay up until about this frame. So that's 96, so they, they go up, they stay up, and then they start to come down. And around 119, they're back in front of the guy again, so back to that halfway point. And then around 138, the arms are straight down. By the time we hit our actual contact point, the arms are further back. So these are important moments that I keep in mind. Once he hits the ground, this is our next probably key pose where he is whoosh, little tiny ball on the floor, all bundled up, 
all squished down. That's our squash frame. And then in between, obviously, there's things like, okay, right there is important because that's when the arms are straight down. That's an easy frame to keep in mind. It also looks like he's sitting. So it makes it easy to kind of know, okay, well, where does the body need to be? Adjust your curves and your graph editor to make sure things are, you know, coming down nicely, but also his body should have an arc to it. There's, there's so much here that I want to talk about, but we're just talking about the posing. The arms are swinging and right about here's where the arms at their apex, a little bit later, his body starts to come up. And I'll look and say, well, I don't have the final frame, but he starts to then rise. So then I would look and say, okay, what's the, the speed of the rise? When do the arms come down? Hopefully that's helpful. So if I were to just, you know, stare at this, I'm going to turn on my tracing paper. And if we just look here, you can kind of see, you know, there's extra little pieces in there, but you can see the overall animation, right? You can feel the overall shot and just those poses alone now have showed us that's what the shot is. We now look at this and go, oh yeah, it's a jump. Not sure what all these lines are, you know, like there and there, but it's a jump. But those are notes to be placeholders for you to not lose your mind when you go to spline. Let's go to another clip. So this is a clip of me doing a uh, vault a couple of years ago. This is reference I made available for some animation mentor students who needed reference. That was fun. Now I want to show you the difference of like when you record one thing over and over and over, especially if it's body mechanics, you may get different takes that are better or worse for different reasons. So I want to show you the comparison, how to pick the right clip. Now I'm going to base this off two things. The, the main key pose of the vault, which in this case would be probably this frame. And I have another version of this clip which looks like this. It's very similar. I recorded them in slow motion and I sped them up a little bit so you can see them here. They're very similar, but I do want to compare like this. We have this pose and this pose. Personally, I think the other one's cooler in this case. So that would be the 04 file. Now, if we scrub forward to the energy and the landing, the momentum that's going forward, this is the pose I've got of kind of like head forward, shoulders up, head down, leaned, you know, the whole like this is, that's the forward moving. If I go to the other clip and we compare that, it's not quite as strong. It more looks like a really strong strut instead of, you know, like a, like a partial run. So each of them has a slightly better or worse part that I like or don't like. You'd be very careful when you Frankenstein clips though, because you have to make sure that like for mechanics, do they jump and land with the same foot, left side, right side, where are the arms? Otherwise you have to try and figure out how to stitch those together from a mechanic standpoint. And that's the whole point of your reference is to help you learn that mechanic stuff. So if you can help it, try not to Frankenstein clips together, either go re-record it, find a different clip, or keep in mind the pose that you liked from the other clip and use that as reference for your reference to know that, okay, I'm gonna use maybe this one because I like the, the vault, but I like the other landing position. So when I get to this frame, I'm actually gonna come back here and compare and say, no, you know what? I, I wanna base it off of this image. And so you just push the pose. That's probably the safer way to do it. Now, if I were to come in here, maybe I wouldn't start my shot off with like being on a wall and running forward. It feels like I'm in a gym, cause I am. But if you had a character who's just running, so maybe I'd start around here. We've got this pose. I would try to get a three quarters view of my reference, by the way, because then I can see that the foot's not just straight down along the forward axis. It's actually kind of bent backwards, which is interesting. So if you pay attention to different angles, you'll learn little things about how we actually move our bodies. But this is definitely a pose I would use. Arms up, shoulders up. You have this cool like curved line of my arm back here. You can kind of see whoosh. So that's kind of cool. Whoosh. This is basically a contact frame. Unfortunately, I'm wearing all black, so you can't really see any definition of which way my hips are turned, which way my shoulders are turned. N not the best way to record reference. I talk about that in the other video. This is also my anticipation. It's kind of obscured by this block, so this isn't great reference. This is why I usually recommend getting multiple angles, if you can, of something like this, because we lose a lot of information. But as far as this goes, you know, this is part of the jump. This is important. So this frame I'd probably keep in mind, the arm up here, um, hand out, the knee coming up. This is all part of the process that I would definitely block in. And then right here, the hand plant. So we've got an IK hand planted here, shoulder up, this arm over here. We've got um, my leg higher than my butt. The other leg still lower, still coming down. The, the foot is still underneath the top of whatever the object is. Um, eyes locked straight ahead and this bend in the torso. Now, somewhere around here, I think is the actual key pose of this moment, which is, you know, hand down. This arm, mostly straight, it's a flexible block. So the fact that it can flex down allows my arm to be a little bit more bent. Keep that in mind, look at the direction of the head tilt. 
You get it. I don't need to really draw over this entire pose. Look how much my foot is like, we see the bottom of my foot. You may have to push the silhouette of these things when you do your animation because this is very muddy. We probably want to have a little bit more of a gap between my legs and pelvis. Um, you may also want to try separating these legs so that there is a space between the bottom of my foot and the other foot. Maybe not, but consider these things. Don't just take it verbatim and make it feel like motion capture. I think this is a pretty decent breakdown. This foot still staying up to get over the object. This foot coming down to prepare for landing. The body starting to twist back in this direction. The head still locked in the same way. So you wanna make sure you're using world space instead of local space for the head, if you know what that means. It'll make things a little bit easier. You don't have to counter, counter animate the head. And right there we have our contact pose. So, you know, toe up, foot pretty straight. This one's coming down. The asymmetry of not having both feet come down at the same time shows that I'm gonna be preserving energy and running, landing on one foot to then absorb the blow uh, that's gonna flex and bend. And then this one can come out and catch the forward momentum to keep the running motion going. But as we said before, we're gonna push this with more of an energetic uh, feel. So probably move the hips forward more with a wider stance to maintain more of that energy. Now I've done several parkour shots and I have a few more that are also parkour, but I'm gonna leave those out because I think this video is getting a little bit long and you're starting to get the gist. So I wanna do something a little bit more acting based that still has some mechanics in it. This is reference for my Link versus Dark Link shot I've been kind of working on on Twitch. It's been a while since I've messed with it, but if you want to see me work on it, I will be getting back to that. Link below for Twitch. Um, this is somewhat body mechanics, but there's some acting. It's a very small scene, scene from the back. But the important things that I kept in mind were, again, the initial position and head angle, head placement, things like that. I was a lot smarter this time wearing brighter colors that stood out from each other against a plain wall with not that much noise. So it was very clear. I also made sure that we could really see where the sword was, so. Another part of this, which goes into filming the reference is I put this sword in the laundry basket with some resistance. Uh, that is a weighted blanket in there so that the sword would actually have to kind of pull past some weight which helped me yank it out really aggressively, which is what I wanted. I didn't want to just pick up a sword. I wanted to have to pull it out of something. So again, that goes back to filming as realistically as you can. I'm also holding a plastic bag with um, wrist weights on my arm. So I have weights on my arm and two points of contact with a bag with heavy cans in it to give me the feeling of a shield from those two points. Cause that's how you would do a shield. So all of this, there's kind of just like this waiting period here. This is all just ambient motion. So from here, so from one to 18, I, I wouldn't really do much. Frame one, frame one 18, everything between to me is about the same, wherever I want that to be, sure. But at 18, that's when I turn my head. So at 31, depending on whether or not I need to retime this, cause I do, you know, I may not take these exact frame numbers, I may condense and change timing, but as far as blocking, frame 31 is when my head gets to the next pose. So the body doesn't move all that much. I do need to adjust everything slightly to feel connected so it's not just the head shouldn't just turn. Other things should kind of move with it to some degree. Um, but that's what I took from here. And if you look at the two poses, there is a whole difference in the body, but that was the first thing I looked for. That holds. Then you see the hand comes out. I look for this. I look for the anticipation before the grab. To me, that's important. So having, you know, the hand outstretched and everything that's with that. So I would do a key on the whole body. I would key all of that and then I think it was two frames later, bam, grabs this. So that is my next keyframe. Also, in case you didn't catch it, look at how the sword actually moves. Um, even if it's in, like embedded in a rock, we should probably see some action. It doesn't have to like bend, but to show something shows a connection between the character and the environment. So I like that. I'm going to keep that. I also see the, the body moving. So that's the next keyframe. I actually slide my hand down the grip a little bit more. So that's a moment that I'm going to keep track of. So that's another key I'm putting in. So I'm putting these little tiny ones in here because I find them important. And then on 53, 54, you know, let's just pretend this sword doesn't move because it's encased in rock. But this where the head is starting to move over, the upper body starting to pull to the side to create torque to yank the sword out. Uh, that to me is an important keyframe, which then I'm going to call it frame 59, even though 60 is really the frame it eases in, but I'm gonna say 59 for pushing reasons. Swords almost, you know, arms almost straight out, swords up, there it is. And if we look at the two of those, you may think, oh, that's that's the change, right? But if you look closely between there, this is the stuff that you miss if you don't look for the little in-between parts. Is if I go in between, 
there's actually on frame 56, my head goes further left than we thought. It goes further left than the original frame that we had before. So if I do that, you kind of see this jitter. You almost see my head go Gug. And that's because my upper body kind of recoils from all that energy. That may be something you want to include um, in, in a lot of cases. Otherwise it might just feel kind of stiff and go Gug. And we don't want that. We want it to feel all connected and organic. So things like this are what we're looking for. So I'm, I'm just looking through my shot, looking for these important moments, these important things in my shot that even if they're not key golden poses, they need to be included in my blocking as I'm planning my animation. And so again, uh, with footsteps, you know, if you want to put this foot, you can kind of see this foot moving. Um, I may put a key on frame 71 because my foot's flat and then it slides to frame 80 and then it moves. So I'd look for, okay, beginning of the slide, end of the slide. And then right here, 84 is when my foot's flat. It kind of peels up a bit, but ultimately 87 is the frame. And I already have something on 87, which is convenient. But 87 is the frame where this actually starts to lift off the ground. That's the last frame, like we said, the last frame where that's actually on the ground. And then I find the end of the jump. So this is how I take that kind of jumping thing full circle into everyday shots, where if it's not a jump, you still have you know, feet placement, where you have a wide translation go up and down, where it kind of goes whoop, off the ground and back onto the ground. You have the equivalent of the jump with the feet. So I'm gonna look for the first and last point of that jump, you know, beginning and ending. And that way I can kind of say, okay, where's the middle point? Where is the location of that foot in that middle point? So in that arc, and that's how I can kind of block in my footsteps. Uh, that makes it a lot easier to know how far do the feet need to move, you know, where are the hips are the halfway point. It helps you to not deal with as much of the confusion of like, I gotta move my character and you have this really wonky like movement path through your shot because you're trying to block it out, but you can't really tell where things are. You look for those milestones and it really helps you put in the right information. And so that's what I would put here. You know, there's not a lot of body keyframes that I need, but there's kind of leaning back and forth and there's foot placement. So I would do that, you know, beginning and end of each step, hold frames in between, and that's how I go about blocking this. And by the way, I did kind of block this out on Twitch. Here is the clip right here of um, Darkling pulling the sword out of the ground. So that's kind of how this turned into that. And that's exactly the workflow that I use. Now, if you found this video helpful, make sure to hit the thumbs up so more people see it. YouTube will recommend it to more people and subscribe if you haven't already. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it's helpful. I get a lot of questions about blocking and workflow and things like that. And while this isn't the only way to do blocking, a lot of different workflows exist and I use a lot of different workflows as well. I feel like this is a very important part of filming and using reference that I don't see talked about very often. And again, if you wanna see this kind of stuff done live and put into practice in Maya, in Blender, whatever software we're using, head over to Twitch, links below. And if you need any help with your animation stuff, whether it's tutoring, troubleshooting, technical support, whatever it is, I'll link to my Patreon down below with a bunch of cool rewards as well as animation tutoring and stuff like that to help you out. And if you wanna share your work and get some feedback on your animation, we have a link to the Discord down below with over 3000 artists in there helping each other to grow and get better. And that's it for me. Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. I do appreciate it and I will see you in the next video.